In Josephus' words, now all the sons of Mizraim, being eight in number, occupied the country from Gaza to Egypt. In fact, the Hebrews adopted Mizraim to mean Egyptian. Mizraim was recorded as Misram in Ugaritic, Misri in the Amarna tablets, Musur in Assyrian inscriptions, and Musri to the Babylonians. An Arabian presence is also possible, even in northern Syria, Tuglath Pileser I appointed a governor not far distant in Musri in North Arabia. Further, Sargon called Peru Sar Musri a king, who was succeeded by Samsea, a queen of Arabia. With the exception of the Philistines, all of Mizraim's sons left sparse traces in various parts of Egypt. In Josephus, Aram was father of the Aramites, whom the Greek called Syrians. The Aramaeans, founded by Aram, situated themselves in the various parts of Syria and Mesopotamia. Aramaic served as a written language in Syria from the 8th century BC. Half the book of Daniel was Aramaic, and Aramaic was spoken throughout Jerusalem at the time of Christ. Known as the forebearer to the Chaldeans, Arphaxad was also called Arufu by the Akkadians and was known to Hurrians in the Nuzi tablets as Arif Hura. How does Genesis 10 impact our theological and anthropological understanding? When we look carefully at the information provided by Genesis 10, amplified by the historical accounts, it helps to clarify what line of theological thought could be true, and it helps eliminate those schools of thought that are already on shaky ground anyway. The typical conservative viewpoint eliminates the entire world's population with a worldwide flood, except for Noah and his family aboard the ark. Conservatives swap around Genesis 10 and 11 so that all of Noah's kin can journey to Babel first, where they build a tower, and when God is displeased, then they are scattered in all directions, speaking new languages. It's creative, perhaps, but certainly isn't biblical. If Genesis is read in a straightforward manner, the dispersion precedes the incident at Babel. Then, too, the idea that the entire landscape of the earth was scrubbed by floodwaters, leaving it bereft of all human life, falls flat, as primitive civilizations are known to exist all over the globe. They're not reached by any of those involved in the dispersion. We know where almost every grandson, every great-grandson, and tribe went, and we don't see China, Australia, Southern Africa, or the Americas on any of their travel itineraries. And the languages spoken among the tribes where we have obtained their writings, Amorite, Hittite, Canaanite, Ugarit, Hebrew, etc., are all Semitic dialects changed by the passage of time and by rubbing shoulders with other cultures. We don't see any of Noah's tribe speaking Mandarin or Celtic or Swahili or Cherokee. Some conservatives pushed the entire Genesis narrative into the past so that Adam and Noah would have lived tens of thousands of years ago to align with the popular belief that Adam was the progenitor of all mankind. Will that work? Well, not only have Noah's descendants been found in the areas we mentioned, but also there is no trace of any of them any earlier than about 4,500 years ago. So we not only know where they went, we also know they didn't get there at an early enough time frame to do that line of thinking any good. So does a more liberal interpretation of Genesis work any better? Not all liberals share exactly the same beliefs, but in general, liberal Bible scholars assign Genesis 1 to 11 to a category they call prehistory or protohistory so that real verifiable history doesn't get recorded until much later, beginning with the prophets, and some will slide that point of time all the way to the New Testament. 
so a catch-all list of preferences won't capture every facet of the various liberal opinions. Many liberals hold to the idea that Adam and Noah were theological constructs, not real people. Early Genesis doesn't have historical value at all, but in their view was written to convey theological messages. Genesis 10 knocks a huge hole in that idea. Who were these tribes who set off and established nations? Did they have no fathers? Did they just miraculously appear in the territories to which they were assigned? Remember, the locations of many of those tribes have been discovered only in more recent years. How would scribes living at the time of Moses, or worse yet, during the Babylonian exile, have manufactured the names of Noah's descendants, concocted their lines of descent, and imagined their ultimate destinations? And lo and behold, when we look many centuries later, voila, there they are. Those theological constructs are alive and breathing. Genesis 10 is a pretty important chapter then, isn't it? It not only affords us a look at the immediate migrations of Noah's post-flood generations, it also helps clarify what schools of thought have possibilities, and it virtually eliminates all the popular schools of thought that are prevalent today. A local flood at about 2900 BC terminates the sinful Adamite generations. Noah and sons regenerate near the landing site in the years intervening until Noah dies. The burgeoning tribes, according to their lines of descent, stake their claim to territories and make their mark on the surrounding cultures. What about God's declaration that he would not bring a flood again of those proportions in Genesis 9-11? The world has certainly experienced massive floods since then with drastic impacts on local populations. Remember the covenant was established with Noah, not with generic mankind everywhere. And as far as we can tell, no areas that contain concentrations of Noah's generations have been inundated by a flood of that magnitude, and certainly not as judgment for sin. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Ken. In our next episode, we will examine what has long been a confusing subject, the Tower of Babel. We hope you can join us.